Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's 20 years since I first came to Besançon. Uh, and at the time, it was quite a risk to um, uh, appoint a New Zealander, but I hope it's worked out. So uh, this is a, a, a talk which will cover a variety of topics, all related to the uh, study of how to make lasers for the future. Now, this work is not, of course, done by only myself. It's done by a whole team of people. And so these are the photographs of the students and postdocs and permanent staff with whom I work. There are a few missing. Some of you are in the room. Uh, but I'd like to thank you all for this, for this work. One of the great strengths of French research is the focus on collectivity. And uh, this is um, an important aspect of our work. Now, the... the, the this year, 2020, is also the laser's 60th anniversary. And over 60 years, the laser has become an essential tool of society. Uh, it was actually uh, first, laser light was first seen on May 16, 1960. And this date has become so important for, in the history of science that the United Nations has now recognised the importance of the laser and its applications in science in general, by declaring the date of 16th of May every year the International Day of Light. Now, lasers themselves generate what we call coherent light. That is, it's a particular form of light that doesn't exist in nature. It has a number of properties such as directionality and phase stability. And it's this particular aspect that is so important in so many different areas of uh, technology. So if you just look at some of the applications of lasers, they cover everything from cosmetic surgery to, uh, to manufacturing to entertainment. And this talk itself wouldn't be possible without the uh, technology of fibre optics communications sending the signal through the internet. Now, the, the, it's important to realise that the, the, the origin of the laser... Uh, itself, although it's become very applied, it was in very fundamentally oriented research. Charles Townes, who was one of the Nobel laureates for the invention of the laser, uh, says in, in, in his uh, biography, what industrialist looking for new cutting and welding devices or what doctor wanting a new surgical tool would have started by studying microwave spectroscopy, which is where he began his research. The whole field of laser physics and quantum electronics is a textbook example of how broadly applicable technology can grow unexpectedly out of basic research. Now, lasers uh, have been recognised by a number of Nobel Prizes, and it's worthwhile pointing this out because uh, the Nobel Prize awards were just uh, uh, a few days ago, uh, la last week, and the there are 16 direct recognitions of Nobel laureates, of which around a quarter involve some kind of research carried out in France. It's important to realise that the, the bases of the recent French uh, Nobel recognitions lies in the research and structures of research that existed 20, 25 years ago. And so this is something which we have to bear in mind as well. We need to, to, to look to the past for... Uh, the ways in which these projects were carried out. Now, there's a. I, I read just over the weekend. I had the chance to see a recent article I wrote, uh, linking all this Nobel work with the, the lasers. It's just been published in Advanced Photonics, and there's a beautiful. The, the publishers made a beautiful high-resolution poster of how light science and lasers have been recognised at the highest level. Uh, even when you think that lasers may not play a direct role, they still play an important role. So, for example, if you look at how the uh, laser interferometries are used to de detect gravitational waves, and the recent imagery of black holes wouldn't be possible without laser guide stars and the techniques of adaptive optics. So, it's, uh, lasers are everywhere. Lasers are important. Uh, and we've been studying them for... In, in Besançon, they've been studied for, for, for uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, uh, our recent work here is focused with the general aim of just making broadband light sources from lasers with controllable properties for applications. Now, the problem is 
that the basic approach to making lasers hasn't really changed since the 1960s. There are developments, there are improvements, but the fundamental way of doing it is still the same. And this becomes very a real issue when you try to make lasers that generate uh, very short pulses of light with high intensity, because these short pulses create not what we call nonlinearities and instabilities. And so a particular aim of our work in, uh, here in Besançon, and that's the subject of the rest of this talk, is to understand and control these laser instabilities to develop lasers operating in uh, new regimes. And uh, we've succeeded in some ways. We've succeeded in other ways that we didn't expect. Uh, and along the way, we've managed to identify some very interesting and in some, some way remarkable links with completely different areas of physics. Now, this is a general talk, so I thought I'd better give a, a, a brief background into how a laser actually works. And it, it, it's not that hard to explain in simple terms. A, a laser involves what we call an optical cavity. So that's some way to confine light. And the easiest way to confine light is with mirrors. So we create two mirrors or some other way of, of feeding the light back, and we just allow the light to bounce backwards and forwards between them. Of course, we need some medium to amplify and to generate the light, and the, the, in, in that way, the light will resonate, what we call resonate, in between uh, these two mirrors at particular defined frequencies. Now, the idea of light or a wave uh, existing and resonating at particular frequencies is something that's well known to us. So this is the Cathedral Saint-Jean in, in Besançon, although the, the S, the C has disappeared, I see. Okay. And if you look at the, the organ pipes in an, uh, in an organ, we know from music that the sound is only uh, allowed to, the, the sound waves only oscillate or resonate at particular well-defined uh, frequencies or wavelengths depending on the dimension of the organ pipe. And so uh, in a laser, the frequencies at which light oscillates are fixed, and it's maintaining the stability of these, which is the important thing. Now, when you want to make a, a laser that produces short pulses, we try to make sure that all these frequencies oscillate in a, in a stable and a fixed way together. And if we can do that, then we can make a periodic train of light pulses. And this can be seen in a little video of a collection of pendulum oscillators. Each oscillator uh, has its own frequency of oscillation that's slightly different. But if we set them all oscillating together, hopefully, there should be some sound playing with this, but it seems to have been disactivated. So I'll just talk and explain what's happening. Uh, as the oscillators, as each, here we are, well, it was there, it's gone, okay. So as the oscillators oscillate at their own frequency, the, the different, the overall structure of the oscillation appears at some point to essentially be noisy and chaotic. But from time to time, we can see that there's some structure present in this oscillation. And if we wait long enough, then the individual phases of each of these oscillators or pendula will reorganize itself and come right back to the very initial state that we started from. And this describes what happens when we can create a laser cavity that can do that. Here we are. When we can create a laser capable of doing this, we can create, if we can do that with optical frequencies, each which oscillate at a different frequency or colour in optics, then these different optical frequencies, when synchronised, uh, we call modes, and these create a, a short train of pulses in time with repetition rates from 100 million times per second up to, to uh, 100 billion times per second. And this, is, this collection of uh, frequencies and their amplitude and phases is what we call the spectrum. So to understand laser operation, you have to understand both the time 
and the frequency domain properties. And this becomes especially difficult uh, in the case of lasers that are based on optical fibre. So we can make lasers with large bulk mirrors and the light physically bouncing backwards and forwards between two mirrors, or we can loop it on itself by confining it inside an optical fibre waveguide. And the optical fibre lasers are extremely important. They generate high power, they're convenient, they're robust. Uh, but because the light is so concentrated in the fibre, this leads to a lot of what we call nonlinear effects and soliton localization that I'll talk about because of the interaction between two effects. One is a time domain effect called dispersion, which tends to spread out a pulse in time, and the other is uh, an effect which alters the frequency of the optical waves through a nonlinear refractive index change. Now, the waves that we're normally used to are these linear waves on a calm sea that would be roughly drawn like this. But as the intensity or the amplitude of the wave increases, the shape of the wave can change and it, become, it can become a bit more peaky, a bit more... Uh, and enhanced in its amplitude. And this is what we tend to call a nonlinear wave. And these nonlinear waves are associated with uh, what we call solitons, which are localised waves on water or localised pulses of light. The first one was seen in, in Edinburgh in uh, 1835, the second on the Canal de Bourgogne, uh, 1863 or 1865, depending on the source. And uh, these soliton-like effects are also uh, associated with the formation of the giant rogue waves uh, or freak waves or vagues that have been described since antiquity. Now, uh, laser dynamics have been studied since the 1980s, but there was some very important work done between about 2005 and 2012 in Dijon by Philippe Prelou and Nihilac Media from Australia, who... Uh, gave us a new formalism, a new approach to understand how these soliton effects can actually uh, stabilise themselves inside a laser. And with this new framework, it's been possible to study uh, a nonlinear structure called a dissipative soliton, which is uh, a physical entity that can exist in the presence of loss or attenuation or loss of energy amplification or gain or the input of energy, as well as nonlinearity and dispersion. And this concept applies to everything. It applies to, uh, to, to, to chemical objects. It probably even applies to human beings. We are all, in some sense, dissipative solitons because we exist because of a complicated balance of different effects. Now, the difficulty is to measure these things. And this is, this is where uh, the talk starts to get a bit technical. But the measurement, to understand something in nature, we have to measure it. And uh, we have to measure it in both the frequency domain to measure its spectrum and the time domain to measure its temporal profile. And so th we, we actually build on some very old physics. We create a temporal analogue, uh, we create a, uh, an analogue of far field diffraction, which is a very uh, uh, basic process in, in optics associated with the wave nature of light, that means that when light propagates through a hole, it takes on the form of the Fourier transform or the spectrum of this object. If we can do that with a short pulse, then the time domain profile takes on the same shape as the frequency domain spectrum. We can also create an, an analogue of a thin lens, an imaging system like a pair of glasses that can create an, an image of an object. And we can uh, perform this by in a rather complicated way uh, using different instruments, but uh, the result is that we're able to magnify a very short pulse, maybe a picosecond, by three or four hundred times to bring it within the measurement capability of an electronic oscilloscope. 
Now, these are actually very old ideas which go back to the 1970s and are uh, articles that were written uh, in, in Besançon and uh, in, in Limoges by uh, Claude Frelli and Alain Lacour. Uh, we recently published a paper in 2019 reminding the world of this history uh, and uh, showing how we were using these concepts uh, today to try to measure uh, new aspects of, of laser dynamics and laser physics. Now, uh, this is the first uh, experimental result of, of our work I'm going to show. Uh, this is the measurement of uh, the dynamics that occur when you turn a laser on. So this is, this is kind of a complicated experimental setup. What this complexity actually reminds us is that these old ideas from the 1970s were really ahead of their time. But the technology to realise them is only available today. But it is available today, and so we can perform these measurements. So we take a, uh, what we call a passively mode-locked fibre laser, one of these lasers that produces short pulses, and we just turn it on, like that. And if you turn it on and you just measure the light that comes out of the laser, it's very unstable, it's very messy, and eventually it stabilises. And even though, things, even though this field has been looked at for 30 or 40 years, this particular regime here has never been looked at in detail because we need to measure over seven orders of magnitude of time. We need to measure soliton structures of a few picoseconds, but over 50 microseconds, 500, 1,000 round trips in the cavity. And if we do this, this is what we find. So this is, this is ex experimental data showing how a pulse in the cavity evolves chaotically over picosecond timescales over 800 circulating round trips. Now, eventually, it becomes stable. But from the point of view of fundamental science, what's much more interesting is the instability from the point of view of technology, what's essential is the stability. So we're, we're focusing uh, more at the moment on this instability uh, because there are some fundamental questions about this. So uh, another, another area of recent work builds on some work uh, uh, almost 15 years ago with Guy Milo, uh from, from Dijon, studying uh, a particular process in nonlinear fiber optics called self-similar propagation. This is where a light pulse propagates at high power. It changes its size, it changes its width, but it keeps the same shape. And this is a different laser design. What's novel about it is that you get two different kinds of localized structure coexisting in the same cavity. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that the, uh, the, the variation of parameters such as the temporal width or the spectral width in the cavity is enormous. Depending on the design, the intracavity energy can change by over a factor of 100 or maybe even 1,000, which is extraordinary for a so-called stable oscillator. So we're able to understand this system very precisely with numerical modelling, and... Uh, using the mesocentre uh, facilities to launch tens of thousands of these simulations, we're able to build up a, a very detailed mapping of the particular adjustments that, that you make to the laser to see different kinds of, of uh, operation. So we can see either stable single pulse operation or unstable operation or bound state molecules, what we call molecules, where you have two pulses uh, interacting and breathing together like a, a vibrational mode of a molecule in chemistry. And in experiments, we're able to see all of these things just by turning different knobs on our laser. It's a remarkable, uh, rich system. Now, uh, what we're also able to do is to look at the... Uh, instability regime, the instability 
the turn-on characteristics of this particular system as well. So uh, this was a, a paper that just appeared uh, this year, and it, it shows a, a selection of pictures. Now, this looks nice and pretty, but what does it mean? Well, uh, what this axis here on the bottom is the wavelength of light. So what we're measuring is the spectrum, but we're not seeing a, a picture. We're, we're plotting this in a false color representation. So we're looking down on a large array of different measurements of spectra uh, at different points in the evolution of the laser. And so when we turn this laser on, we see that the spectrum initially starts off quite narrow. It suddenly explodes. That's a zoom level, a zoom of the exploded region up here, and then it stabilizes again. Now, why does it do this? To be honest, we don't know. It's just one of the very complex states of these uh, highly dimensional nonlinear systems that we're trying to understand. We can also see many different examples of, of uh, if when it's operating stably, we slightly adjust one of the parameters, we can start to see the, the, the behavior of the laser change, and we see all sorts of different behavior, uh, whether it's in the in the spectral domain or the time domain. And uh, we're currently trying to make even more extreme laser designs to see uh, even more uh, rich dynamics. Now, one of the unexpected things that we've discovered during this whole area of research, not only in lasers, but also studying the, the basic area of propagation, are the links that this area of instability has with the propagation of wave groups on deep water. In some circumstances, the mathematics that describe the propagation of a light pulse in an optical fiber are exactly the same as the mathematics that describes a wave on deep water. And it, this was the work that was uh, studied since about 2008 during the uh, period of the ERC and also with a, a very critical collaboration with um, Bertrand Kibler from Dijon. Uh, Twelve years after we finally, after we started that work, we finally were able to conclude what the answer was, writing a, a very detailed review and being able to extend the, uh, the, the analogy not, not only from optical fibres, but also to, to laser systems. And I mentioned that just because it's really important to highlight that research takes time. Uh, the, the, the typical three-year or four-year duration of a project is really only the start of something that takes often multiple projects before you really find the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the objective you're looking for. We often use vocabulary where we talk about fundamental research or applied research, I think the, the wording is a, bit, is a bit imprecise. We should really be talking about long-term research and short-term research. It's much clearer in defining where the funding is needed and, and what we're looking for. But that's politics. And at the moment, I'll get back to some science to talk about the next steps, because we would like to be able to say, when we look at a picture like this, that we actually understand what's going on. Now we, 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 we don't. And for that, we're starting to use tools of artificial intelligence. And in particular, we're, uh, uh, we're using artificial neural networks. And just to describe very quickly what they are, they're, they're complex computer algorithms that provide a universal means of approximating essentially an arbitrary transfer function. So we can look at a complex structure in uh, wavelength, and we can try to correlate it with a complex structure in time. And just to, what we're particularly looking for is how to uh, look at a spectrum and to guess, if you like, what the, cor what the corresponding time domain field is. Can we predict the intensity of a time domain peak looking only at a very noisy and structured spectrum. Well, it turns out that we can. The details are, are, 
for the experts, they can read them quickly there, but we can essentially uh, reproduce this behaviour very uh, precisely, and we've recently published a couple of nice papers on that. But the real aim is this. Ideally, we'd want to get rid of the human from aligning the laser. So we'd like to put ourselves out of work, in a sense. Right? We would like to be able to make a laser that could not only start up, but it could control itself, it could target a particular regime of stability or a particular regime of instability. And uh, this is really the, the holy grail of uh, research, and this is what I think will keep me busy for the next five or ten years. So these are the conclusions uh, of uh, five, five years of work or so. We've developed new lasers, we've developed new measurement techniques, we've uh, extended studies of participative soliton lasers, we've clarified links between optical and hydrodynamic stabilities, and we're starting to use machine learning to analyse these. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Perfectly on time, so we can take one or two questions. Yeah. I have a, slight, uh, a question about uh, the video you showed at the beginning. Uh, the different pendula with different lengths. Yep. Uh, I, I never play, unfortunately, with them, which would, uh, I really regret. Uh, but maybe I will do this uh, next year. Um, are there couplings between the, the pendulum uh, from one to the next? or No. Absolutely no coupling. There's just independent, independent modes. But, in, in a, but they are, they are synchronised. Uh, manually, just by the fact that you move them together. Now, in a, in a real system, if you wanted them to develop the synchronization uh, from noise, you would have to couple them non-linearly. So, uh, otherwise, it, it just wouldn't work. And you can actually see when you watch the movie, they become asynchronized after a while, precisely because they're not coupled. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What is the budget for such experiment you described at the end for the equipment? Uh, okay, just well, to give you an, an idea to the okay, so, outside so, of so, the community. Yeah, sure. So, so typically the equipment budget for this kind of uh, uh, experiment, if you wanted it to run over five years with all the measurement and and, and diagnostic equipment, you would need at least. 500, 600,000 euros. So we, we've benefited from uh, a lot of investment in high quality uh, uh, electronic equipment, fast oscilloscopes at the state of the art. And the, these can individually cost 250,000 euros, but it lasts 10, 10 years if you uh, treat it well. But typically, to do these experiments, you'd be looking at, uh, if you were to buy everything that you needed, uh, starting from nothing, you'd be looking at five or six hundred thousand euros. Of course, the grants that you you apply for add on to that to to stay at the state of the art. You're not always asking for for that amount of money. Although, if you could ask for it, I would ask for it. And this is also only for the case of the optical fibre system, where we benefit from the availability of a lot of components on the market uh, transferred from telecommunications. If you were to do the same thing with high power lasers, you would multiply that by 10 or even 100 to, to the kind of lasers used for fusion research or so on. Thank you. Maybe a, a last question, a little bit outside from science, so you know that uh, is it uh, BFC would like to promote RFC application in here? So you have a great experience. Uh, do you have any advice to, 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 yeah, to promote RSC application to young researchers and also to old ones? I, I think the, the... So I've got both good and bad experience with the ERC because my success rate in application is about one in four. In other words, I received one, but I've applied 
for three others which I didn't get. And I think this is perhaps the biggest thing to, to highlight, the fact that in our own community, as successful academics, we are not used to failing. We're not used, we don't like the feeling of asking for something and being told no. We don't expect it. And when we are dealing with people who are at our level, and in many cases well above our level, we have to recalibrate, and anyone in here with the appropriate project can be funded. At, sometimes the ERC is not always the right instrument either. There are also, uh, it doesn't apply to, to, to all researchers, but I think there are many people here who can, and funnily enough, it's, I think it's much easier at the starting level and the consolidator level uh, because the committee is, is much, less, much more open to supporting a good project and it recognises that depending on where you came from in Europe, the opportunities to publish in nature or science aren't the same. And that's taken into account. At the advanced level, that isn't taken into account. But, uh, so certainly at the starting level, I'd encourage anyone with a good, uh, good idea to put together a project and not to get discouraged when it doesn't work. That's the important thing. So thank you, Jim. Okay.